There's a comment from Claudia um, looking at language um, of the media and politicians in Germany when they speak about refugees, um, using the metaphor of water a lot, it's a stream of refugees, a flood, tsunami, people drowning, the boats are full. Um, that kind of language is also common in other countries. Um, it's not just specific to Germany. And I think this could be a really good segue into the next part of your research, which actually, which actually looks at the, um, the metaphors and the what are the acupuncture points, what are the pressure points used by the government um, around race and class and how, yes, there, there's, there are only counter arguments from proponents of more equitable framing around race and class. And we're, we're at, we as proponents or like more radical activists for equitable considerations are actually floundering a little bit. And the opposition here comes up with better terms or at least more emotionally resonant ones, um, if not um, false ones. So I would segue into the presentation around that. And then we can, again, open it up into more uh, fluid discussion. OK, shall I start that now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. And we get out of this one. Sorry, hang on, let me uh, unshare. My computer doesn't like me leaving full screen mode on Zoom. Okay, so this is, so after I finished that work with Freedom From Torture, I uh, became the director of a think tank in the UK called CLASS. Uh, we look at, at the sort of lives of working people in the UK. Um, and basically we try to uh, support organizations in organizing working people. Um, and um, we uh, are supported by, I think it's, 10 unions, I can never remember how many, um, in the UK, uh, they founded us. So we have a very strong connection to the trade union movement in, in this country. So this project is called the Race Class Narrative Project. And the purpose of it is to find a story that brings working class people together and neutralizes dog whistle racism. Now, those of you who are not from Britain will understand a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, because I think it's present in many countries in, in some form. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to develop a positive new narrative that brings people together and unifies the multi-ethnic working class as an alternative to divisive rhetoric and dog whistle racism. We need to shift the discourse on race and class away from Anglo nationalism, um, which is often where it's focused at the moment. We need to neutralize dog whistle racism and xenophobia. And, uh, I hope this isn't patronizing, but for, just in case the dog whistle doesn't translate, it sort of means um, like racism that's under the radar, um, that you sort of know what it is when you hear it, but it isn't explicit. Um, and build massive coalitions to push for progressive change through trade unions, social movement, and electorally. And we need to inspire and energize our base to sustain mobilization. So these are what we want to do. So basically, these are some lovely uh, headlines from newspapers in this country, uh, basically setting out the story that's already been told. So the right has used narratives about identity politics to divide communities and convince people that one of the threats, the biggest threats that they face is their neighbors. Uh, narrative can shape policy. So they shape, so basically um, they shape what we think is possible and they influence our choices and behavior. For example, people's voting patterns and you know how prevalent hate crimes are so you can see here uh, these are some of the, the the newspaper headlines in the UK over the last few years um, that are pushing this uh, antagonistic race class story which I will share with you now so we did this language analysis where we looked at over 500 sources to understand how is race class talked about race and class talked about by our opponents in this country. And we use the, the, all of these sources to identify the metaphors, values, and 
stories that shape the common understanding of race and class. So this is the story that we have found. This is what uh, the opposition of this country, by that I mean mainly the government, but there's some elements of people in the center and even on the left who use this story as well. So the ideological obsession with political correctness has led the out of touch liberal elite to heap privileges on minority and help them get away, get ahead at the expense of white working class people, especially boys. Um, we stood up to the establishment by, by voting for Brexit to take our country back from immigrants in 2016. And now we are courageously standing up to the woke mob and fighting for our history and culture and the white working class's needs. So this is essentially the story that the right are telling in this country. And it affects everything from uh, recently there were protests that were demonized because um, it was suggested that people might vandalize a statue of Winston Churchill. Um, uh, to, um, you know, how we understand government and the purpose of government. It sort of influences every part of British life, this story. And you can see there that we've broken it down into its component parts. So uh, the way that it works is um, the opposition talk about us, and by us, I mean anyone who's interested in structural racism and cares about it, anybody who supports um, the rights of migrants and refugees. Um, and anyone with progressive politics. So they call us a cult. Uh, they say that we are brainwashed, um, that we can't be reasoned with and that we're irrational. Um, they, uh, they talk about equality as a zero sum game. And what that means is that um, where one minority succeeds, another must fail. So they say that working, sorry, white people and people of color cannot both be happy and successful that one must take away privileges from the other. And so what the job is now, according to the right, is to even out the balance by taking privileges back of people, from people of color and giving them to white people who have been left behind and forgotten about. Um, they talk about it as though it's a war. So they say standing up to the woke mob um, and uh, that we're on opposite sides, uh, only one, only one can be victorious, either white people or people of color. But when they say that, they also mean um, only one side ideologically can be victorious, them or the left, the woke mob. So they, so the woke mob, us, must be defeated. And they racialize the working class as white. So in this story, um, working class people of color do not exist. Working class people of color are part of the woke mob. Um, white people are inherently male, uh, sorry, working class people are inherently male um, and inherently white in this story, and everyone else is excluded. It also contains some whitewashing of history. So part of the story is how great the British Empire was, what a hero Churchill is, how wonderful the monarchy are. And um, if you deviate from that at all, then you're immediately categorized into the woke mob, um, and then you're the enemy. Um, and... Um, they also suggest there is a conflict between white British natives and immigrants as well. And one thing we found in earlier research is that this, this uh, story is not only working on members of the public who um, don't like immigrants or are suspicious of immigrants, it's also actually working on immigrants themselves. So in one of our uh, earlier research projects where we interviewed um, uh, members of the working class who were people of color or immigrants, they would say, I'm not working class, even though they were you know, working for minimum wage and they couldn't afford to pay their rent. They would say, I'm not working class. Um, working class people are white men who worked in mines. That isn't me. I'm an immigrant. So it's even working on working class people themselves who don't see themselves as part of a class um, and who are sort of buying into this divisive idea that um, that the working class is inherently white, older and male. So what do we need to do? So we have found when we, um, when we also looked at what we're saying, we found that we're not saying anything. So if you remember in the refugee project, um, I said that um, what we were saying wasn't very good. And I gave some examples of that. Well, when it comes to talking about race and class, we're not saying anything at all. We're not even telling a bad story. We are telling no story because we seem to have collectively decided that the way that we oppose this rash, sorry, this reactionary, vicious story about um, 
the real divisions in society between, are between working class, white working class people and people of color is by standing back and being dispassionate and being a, dis detached and it isn't working. Instead, what's, what's happening is we are being framed as the enemy in the story, as the woke mob, and we have nothing to say about that. So we need to create our own story. We need to stop using the opposition's metaphors and story because when we do talk about them, all we do is repeat their story and then talk about how bad it is. We don't have a story of our own. We need a positive vision to buy into. And as I said in the previous research, we need to lead with shared values and not problems. And we need to center people themselves in their story. And this is some, a quote from Anat Shankar Azorio. A great message doesn't say what's already popular. A great message makes popular what needs to be said. So again, we need to persuade people. Um, and in previous research, we have identified these four characteristics that unify the working class. So they live precarious lives. They feel powerless. They feel pushed out of where they live um, and they experience prejudice. So these are four areas where we can really be begin to unite people around their shared experiences rather than allowing them to be divided because their skin is a different color, because they have a different religion or because their immigration status is different. So this is what we're doing. We, um, are, Matt, we've, we've done this, we've conducted the analysis. Um, that's what I just showed you, the language analysis. Um, and we are, at the moment we're doing qualitative research. So I'm pleased to say that yesterday we just finished um, part one of our first phase of qualitative research where we, we're doing 18 in-depth interviews across the country with multi-ethnic working class people. We wanna understand how they see working class, um, sorry, race and class. And we want to understand what they believe in, what they worry about, what their lives, our life experiences are like. And then the second phase, we're gonna do two big focus, uh, sorry, three big focus groups where we're gonna initially test some messages. Um, and then we're going to write some messages and we're gonna conduct some dial testing like I've shown you in the last, um, in the last project. Um, and this is our project structure. So we have, um, we, we're basically, like with this event, we are spending a lot of time talking to organizations, listening to, and campaigners and listening to what they have to say. And all of that is being absorbed into our project. So um, I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we have this advisory board who are helping us, which is um, basically made up mainly of racial justice organizations in the UK, um, as well as some members of parliament and some academics. Um, and we're conducting these interviews with people from across the UK who have particular interest in this issue. Because the last thing that we want with this project is that it just gathers us on a shelf. We need to get it out there in the hands of people who are going to use this kind of messaging. And that's where our connection to the trade union movement really comes in. So at the moment, we're talking to a union about developing a pilot training course for people on this messaging and on this issue. Um, and yeah, so this is where we are at the moment. Uh, these, again, these are the um, in-depth interviews. Um, the focus groups. So we are going to be holding the focus groups in Wolverhampton, Brad Bradford and Newport. And then the dial testing. Um, so, so this is the dial testing. So this is when the message is going to start with a shared value, state the problem explicitly, and then we're going to have a call to action. And at the bottom there, you can see an example of the dial testing in the um, American version of this project. Um, so yeah, and here's the um, base persuadables and opposition message that I talked about before. So this is our big aim. Don't preach to the choir, mobilize it. So we need to come up with messages that mobilizes the people who agree with us and then use those people to persuade the persuadables and alienate the opposition. And then finally, we're going to be disseminating it. So we are going to produce lots and lots of materials and share them around as much as possible, um, including lots of presentations. We're going to be going to lots of conferences. We're going to be speaking in lots of places. Um, and these are some places where we're going to disseminate it, as well as, of course, the trade union movement with whom we have very strong connections. And then finally, next year, and the reason this is blue is because it's not yet funded. Um, we're going to build a race class uh, network in the UK. Uh, and I will just talk through that now. Oh, no, sorry, that slide isn't there. So basically, the race class network in the UK is um, 
we are going to create a network of people at a policy and communications level and also a grassroots level to spread the race class narrative in the UK. So we're going to be creating training for organizations to um, adopt race class messaging in their communications. And we're also going to be training community activists to use race class messaging in their communities. And we're gonna be developing materials that are practical tools that people can use in order to um, weave the race class message through everything that they're doing. So things like phone banking scripts, canvassing guides, messaging guides, that kind of thing. So our aim really is, a, it's a big aim, but we're, gonna aim, we're aiming to do what the US uh, race class did, which is fundamentally change the way that race and class is discussed in this country. And in the US, uh, the project started in 2017. And by 2020, it was adopted by the Democrats as a key um, foundation for the communications um, of the 2020 election. And in every state, where the race class narrative was used, it went to the Democrats. Um, and in the initial, the initial pilot for the race class narrative in the US was in Minnesota, which used the race class narrative and won every single state race that it fought, um, the Democrats there. So we have a similar aim with this project. We want it to get it out there in communities. We want to run pilot schemes and we want to um, develop, uh, help de develop community organizers to use this work themselves so that eventually people will organize around their shared material interests rather than seeing their neighbor as their enemy. And we believe it's through this that we can change the landscape of uh, progressive politics in this country, uh, you know, as, as well as a lot of other things like community organizing, power building and so on. But we think that this is an important tool um, to really change the political landscape of Britain. And um, I'm really keen to hear from people in other countries as well, because I know that you have your own version of the opposition story in your own countries. And um, I think it's really important that we work together um, because I've interviewed a lot of people on the right um, as part of my work. I can, I, I can tell you they're all working together across borders. So we need to as well. So yeah, questions. Nice. Um, I've, I've got a question from Chiara who has to leave. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it. Um, so she actually asks um, in, a, in a private message. So uh, that's why I'm reading it out. Um, could you say something more about um, the techniques um, that are used to hammer the carefully crafted messages into the subconscious of the persuadables, considering that this has been the secret weapon of the right in with the example of Cambridge Analytica? Um, and are there conversations on similar strategies that we can use to hammer the message in, um, or perhaps not hammer the message in, but, you know, Pied Piper, uh, uh, flute the message in, um, like, and, and then I guess this refers to this last bit that you mentioned on, and also what happened in Minnesota, like, how is this, how are these stories, when the stories are developed, first you've got to get a story, how do you how do we pass the story into the into the sixty four percent more or less? Uh, well, the first thing that you do is you energize your base. So this is the important this is the reason why that we we all we never want to make messages that alienate our base. Um, and this is actually uh, something that particularly progressive political parties have really struggled with um, over the last kind of two decades. Is that in trying to win the persuadables? Um, they will use messages that alienate their base. Um, and this is, this is, you know, caused enormous problems that you can see in, in like, I mean, in the UK, you can see that with um, very low dwindling voter turnout, which only seems to negatively impact the Labour Party. Um, and so what we need to do is energize our base. We need to give them messages that make them get out of bed in the morning and go and preach them. And that's because, so you mentioned K, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Nothing that anyone ever sees on Facebook or anyone ever sees on the news or anyone ever hears from a politician will ever be as trustworthy and as, and, and as reliable as something that they will hear from their sister, from their friend, from their coworker. I, um, we, the reason we believe in energizing the base is because we think that the base is the best message carrier that we will ever have. It is better than Cambridge Analytica. It is better 
than the news. It is better than politicians. And we all know this. All of you, I'm sure at some point, have bought a product or have been to a restaurant because one of your friends was like, it's so great, you need to try it. And maybe before that point, you were like, oh yeah, I've heard it's quite good. But, um, but as soon as your friend is like, you've got to try this, you've got to do this, you do it straight away, right? Because you think, because you trust them. Um, and that's the same, uh, that's the, it's the same principle when it comes to energizing the base. Um, so that really for us is the major technique. Um, and that is the kind of real like linchpin of this research is that um, if we energize our base and we give them the tools, if we give one person in a household the tools to communicate persuasively, they can communicate with, they can persuade everybody in that household. And um, just on personal experience, um, this is something that I saw happen very, very um, strongly in, um, in Britain after the EU referendum. So of course, Leave won the EU referendum. Um, and as part of my job, because I used to be a journalist, I, I went to various areas in Britain and I interviewed people about why they voted Leave and why they voted Remain. And one thing that was quite striking that we didn't really hear much about in the news was that, because we heard a lot about people voting Leave and then regretting it. But actually I found people who voted Remain and regretted it. And the reason for that was that their friends who voted Leave were so excited about leaving the EU um, and were so energized by having won the referendum that they went around persuading all of their other friends and family that voting Remain was a mistake and they should vote Leave. So I met people who would say, yeah, I voted Remain, but I should have voted Leave and I'd vote Leave if I had the chance to do it again. And that's an example of how the base can actually persuade people and change their minds through conversations. And it's a question of trust and that's why it works. And uh, Emily's adding uh, also the influence of influencers uh, who might not be the people you know, but they would still be part of the base. Um, still people you follow and influencers are only influential if there has been an, a, a relationship established, even not a personal relationship, one of longer term following so that they actually, people will actually listen and care about what these people say. So again, right. You know, I think that's so true. I think there's um, so a friend of mine is a is a is a bit of an influencer, and uh, she uh, put on Instagram a while ago that she uh, liked a face cream, and the brand that owned the face cream immediately emailed her and sent her hundreds of pounds worth of product uh, as a thank you. Now you don't do that if it doesn't work, you know, and the reason for that is because influencing is a sort of relatively new thing. But it sort of occupies this strange space between a distant celebrity and a friend because it's a celebrity that you're very intimately engaged with you often you see parts of their day you see their personal lives you can comment on their pictures and know that they read them and sometimes that they might re reply to you um, and so this is why it's become influencing has become so enormous and so lucrative for some people because it's essentially somebody who occupies a, a, a friend-like position, but that they often will have an audience of hundreds of thousands of people. So you're right that influencing is also an area where, um, where the conversation can be changed because it's a sort of this relatively new type of relationship. Um, also, I, there was something from Julia. Yeah, I just have a, a maybe quick question um, that I didn't really uh, catch when, when you were going through the, um, through the presentation, which was um, the point where there was like a, a circle and four things that uh, basically um, are being, I don't know, um, um, positioning or I don't know exactly what the pro uh, what the point was there um, uh, positioning the uh, the working class or the race class um, narrative prejudice power place and some other term were mentioned can you precariousness. say precariousness oh and can you say something like just a, a quick sentence for me to understand what that was about yeah so that um it's this uh, framework that we've developed um, with our research called, we call it the four Ps, um, because we obviously part, a big part of this research is understanding what unites working class people. And what we found is what unites 
these people are the four P's. So they all live precariously. Uh, precar precariously? That's, yes. Uh, I forgot how to say that word then. Um, you know, they all they all worry that where, you know, um, whether they're going to be able to pay their bills. Um, they all worry that, like, whether they're going to, um, like, whether something is going to happen to their housing or not. Um, that they basically live hand to mouth every month. Uh, and this is an experience that unites working class people. Um, power, because all working class people feel powerless in their own lives. They feel powerless in their jobs. They feel powerless um, politically and they feel powerless in their communities. Things change in their communities uh, without their without their influence. Um, and they feel prejudiced. People, uh, working class people of all races feel prejudiced. Uh, they either feel... Um, demonized as sort of lazy and feckless if they are white or as um, dangerous and deceptive if they are um, immigrants and of course people of color have obviously experienced um, racism and then place uh, that was that people feel very attached to the place that they grew up in but often feel like they have very little power over it so um, often one problem that we heard a lot was that people often feel that the area that they live in is either becoming too expensive for them to live in and they may have to leave, or it is deteriorating and declining in a way that is outside of their control. So it's this feeling of living in a community that you care about, but having little control over what happens to it. So the reason that we mentioned that in the presentation is because these are the issues that unite working people. And these are the issues that we can eventually talk about and organize around. Ah, yeah, I see. That's that was then my second question. Okay, thank you. And we also have a question from Claudia. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. One of them is um, related to weaving or co-creating this new narrative. You know, this sounds a little bit artificial to me. So I was also wondering, even if there aren't already stories and narratives you know that we then could bring together to compose it in a different way but not like creating something from the scratch at least this is how it landed in me you know like we have to come up with a different story that's the first question and the second question is uh, related to when I hear working class and I my in my first perception it's male dominated I also thought about football, which because it's also like working, working class hobby, you know, I'm stereotyping, but I'm also aware that there for a long time that these campaigns like say no to racism, where I thought like say no to racism is strengthening racism, you know, I mean, this is bullshit. Yeah. So now they came up with um, stand up for tolerance and inclusion or diversity or whatsoever. We are one club, you know, and I also see this with Mohamed Salah was playing for, with Liverpool that I think he was also, his presence was kind of changing or staring up first is racist whatsoever. And then there were people maybe persuadable to suddenly realize that it's all about football. And since he's scoring and doing magic, you know, that they kind of went in a, in a different uh, direction also with the narrative. So I'm wondering if for your working class project, if there's something to take from this racism in sports, especially in, in football. So these were the two questions. Uh, so on the first question, um, we won't be starting, we won't be sort of creating a new story out of nothing um, because there's research that's already been done. So we'll want to sort of use that and look at that. Um, so part of our work is sort of, we, we are also building a collection of existing research because we don't, we obviously, we, we should use it. Um, but also one of the main reasons why we're doing these interviews and focus groups that are very in-depth is because we want to bring the story out of what people are saying themselves. Um, because we want to create a story that feels natural to say. We don't want people to use it and feel like they're a politician giving a speech. We want them to use it because it feels natural for them to say it. And so we're, what we're hoping is our eventual winning story will be a combination of um, what people are currently saying and what the research is telling us works. And then in terms of um, football and sport, I think, I think what you're, um, 
what you're getting at there, I think what you're picking up on is that um, uh, people form opinions based on their lived experiences. Um, I have a friend whose mum has become obsessed with Black Lives Matter um, and has bought Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Um, having she, she doesn't have any interest in politics, but it's because she really likes Formula One and Lewis Hamilton is in favor of Black Lives Matter. So she's become really enthusiastic about it. And, um, and I think what you're, what you're sort of uh, showing there with football is that um, people form their opinions um, from the culture that they live in, the stories that they've been told and the experiences that they've had. And also that the more they're able to see someone's humanity, the less they're able to hold prejudices towards them. So I think like, um, you know, I'm a Liverpool fan and there's a lot of chants about Mo Salah being a Muslim, but it's kind of like, he's a Muslim and so are we, or something like that. You know, like it's about how uh, sort of celebrating the fact that he's a Muslim because they, uh, Liverpool fans feel an ownership over him because he's their star player. And so they're defending him against the racism he's experienced by doing that. And the reason for that is because um, he's their hero and that has humanized him to them. So I think that's what you're, um, what really ultimately I think is what you're talking about there is a really, really important principle of communications, which is that we always need to be humanizing um, groups that are demonized because that's how you neutralize the problem. And, and it's also a whole area that is disregarded by a lot of academic research, um, the effects of popular culture on political value systems. Um, I would call on John to ask the next question. Thanks, Ivan. And thanks, Ellie, for all of this. It's great. I, I just wondered whether you had seen um, research which kind of tries to assess how relevant the US experience of the last few years is for uh, social movements in other countries. So we've been talking a lot about Anat's work and what happened with the race class narrative uh, in swing states in the US presidential cycle, but I've been working quite a lot on climate change communications in recent months. And um, many people in the UK would say the last thing, absolutely the last thing that we want to have in the UK on climate change is the repeat of the US experience, which they've just had a super polarized debate about climate change with no center ground, no common ground at all. And so I'm just kind of really interested in, in whether you've seen people try to assess the extent to which the same kind of approaches and techniques will work equally well in different political settings and, and different cultural contexts or, or not, um, either on race or on other issues. That would be really useful research to have for me. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that's a really important point because um, I think I do think um, that one of the problems that progressives uh, make in this country is that they try to airlift American politics out of America and then just crudely dump them in Britain. And that ignores the fact that our cultural and historical context in Britain and geographical uh, context in Britain is so, so different. Um, so, so in terms of our project, the race class project, um, we have been very careful not to just borrow uh, the work from the US. We've used the methodology, but we have um, done our own language analysis of the particular architecture of the story in this country. Um, and we are working with, we're going to be working with Anat on it, but um, but Anat and us are very clear that we are working purely on methodology and that actually the sort of cultural values and the stories that we tell and the things that we talk about are going to be specific to the UK. And we're not just going to borrow from uh, the US. Um, and in terms of the, the practical question of what research has been done. So Compass is currently running a course on um, rural organizing in the US, which basically takes the um, experiences of community and organizing in the US that you mentioned and discusses how to apply them uh, to the UK context. Um, so that is that is work that's being done. Um, and um, we're also working with another organization called the Civic Power Fund, which att attempts to take, oh, you know, you'll know them, won't you? Because you work with Unbound. 
So Civic Power Fund uh, takes the community organizing model of the US and tries to apply it in a British context. So, um, so those are the research that, that I can be aware of, but um, I absolutely agree with you that it's inappropriate just to take the American context and apply it in Britain. And it's, it's certainly something that we're being sensitive towards um, with the race class project. And I think one practical example of that is that um, the race class narrative in the US focuses very heavily on anti-black racism. Whereas we found that our race class story in the UK is very Islamophobic um, it, obviously, there is an element of anti-black racism, but it's very Islamophobic. Um, it's very hostile towards even white immigrant groups. So um, Irish travelers and Central European migrants are two groups who are victims of the race class story, despite having white skin. Um, and it's also about sort of generic wokeness. Um, because in the US, there is more of a link between wokeness and black activism, because that's where it stems from. Whereas in this country, there is less of a link because we just borrowed it from the US. Um, so that's sort of one way that we've identified already that we are going in a different direction to the US when it comes to this, this issue. And uh, I'm, we're almost at time. And so I would, I would ask um, a final question. And, uh, and I know that there's lots more. Um, so we will find ways to have more spaces like this. And also the work that Ellie's doing is mega important. And it only works if we continue having conversations. Um, what I would like to know, and I maybe, I don't know, it's, uh, let me know what you think, but when, we choose to stand for something not vanilla, not middle of the middle of the road, and we do cause this alienation. Isn't there this risk that this could also really fuel the opposition uh, and kind of in a bit of a cycle of intensity um, in the opposition? And if so, what do we do there? Um, Are you asking me? Kind of. I mean, I'm also opening it up to everyone, but um, but yeah, what do you think? Um, I think that um, the opposition is already very fueled. Uh, well, they are in this country at least, and I think that. Um, uh, so let me let me look at, let me let me speak again about the Australian example. So the Australian where they where they did the uh, the research, the refugee research that I mentioned. So before this research was done, one in ten Australians would unprompted say that the biggest issue facing the country was too many asylum seekers. So they would say that just off, out of the blue. After this research was done, uh, it, it went down to one in a hundred. Um, and obviously I'm not saying this research was the one thing that fixed that, but I think the most important thing that this research did was it made the refugee sector behave how the right behaves. Because how the right behaves is they say, we want this, we want this, we want this. And then they get it and they say, that's not good enough. And they move the goalposts. So, and, then, and that is how public debate always shifts further and further to the right. And actually what Australian refugee advocates started to do was that they would say, we want this one thing. So for an example of a campaign that they won was, we want people in detention centers to be given mobile phones. We want that, that's important. We should have that. We're not gonna let it go. And then they, they won. And then they were like, that's not good enough. We don't want anyone on offshore detention. And then like, I mean, they haven't won that yet, but they have got people offshore detention who have medical, um, from offshore detention who have uh, medical conditions that need treating. And so now they go to mainland Australia. And then they were like, that's not good enough. We don't want any children in detention. And they managed to get um, children off one of the um, offshore detention islands. Um, and so that that is the change that this research has made in Australia is it's given uh, the sector a, an, an insurgent and confident attitude that has sort of enabled them to instead of worrying that people aren't going to like what they say because people don't like refugees they go out there and they're insurgent and they make demands and they actually are slowly dragging the debate away from the right and so I think um, it is quite scary to go out there and sort of stir things up but I think that we need to remember that the other side have already stirred things up so we, uh, so we need to sort of have the confidence and the sort of the insurgent attitude, at, you know, and the knowledge that most people do agree with us um, to go out there and do the same thing ourselves. And I, and I do 
believe and always have believed that we can win. Um, so. I'm going to end it here because that's a good note to end it on, on a Friday afternoon, the insurgent attitude and the we can win um, vibe. So thank you very much, Ellie, for joining us. And thank you everybody for your questions. Um, I'm going to send around um, the, the clip uh, to the network. You can freely share it with everybody and join us next month on Disco's Distributed Cooperative Networks and Organizations, which is commons-based um, cooperative feminist economics um, models and structures for work with Stacco and Anne-Marie. And uh, yeah, have a good weekend, everybody.